Okay, so we really have some great keynote speakers. I want to th say thank you in advance again, or you know, just bring attention now to Chris Terrell, Michelle McCory, just so good I'll speak about Michelle later on, Father Andrew Pinsent, Brantley Milligan, uh, Robert Breedlove. And so the story of the conference really is um, early in the discernment of this, I, I, I thought, well, who could I get to speak and, and who really would be important? And I shared with uh, Mark when he and I had a chat one time that uh, his yes, um, his yes really, really helped this conference. It gave credibility, and then adding Michelle and then others gave uh, credibility. So uh, I've thanked Mark before, and I want to thank him again now. So by way of introduction, Mark Yusko is doing really, really important and great things uh, in the world of finance and, and now digital assets. He's the founder and CEO of Morgan Creek Capital Management. He's the managing partner of Morgan Creek Digital. He began uh, the first Morgan Creek in 2004. They have $2 billion uh, in discretionary and non-discretionary assets. Prior to his work in founding of Morgan Creek, Mark was the CIO and founder of University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, the, uh, the endowment, the school endowment. He was the senior investment director um, for prior to that for the University of Notre Dame, and he'll share a story about that perhaps as to what he did there. He's really, again, he's brought this endowment model into Morgan Creek as, as much of his lens for how he uh, invests uh, the money of, of people who entrust Mark with their resources. Mark uh, has his BA with honors from the University of Notre Dame and his MBA in accounting and finance from the University of Chicago. Mark is, uh, is a committed businessman, a committed Catholic, and he's been very gracious to me and gracious to many causes. Uh, let's w welcome him warmly, Mark Yusko. All right, thanks, Matt. And thank you for getting the applause out of the way before I talk. Because um, by the time I get done talking, there might not be a lot of applause. Who knows? Uh, oh, there we go. I'll well, we'll go back. All right, so I have way too many slides. So I'm going to do speed sliding. You don't need to see everything on the slide, just direction, color. I'll point you to a few things. You can have the slides. I'll send them to you. Uh, I stole them from other people. You can, you can steal them from me. Um, but the message is get off zero, right? Zero exposure to digital assets is the wrong number. Now, I'm not saying 100 is the right number, but zero is the wrong number. And you can't afford, literally can't afford to not have exposure to digital assets in the future. So the left-hand side up here is what we're talking about, blockchain technology and digital ledgers, things like that. On the right-hand side is the digital divide. You ask anyone under 35, I'm sorry, anyone over 35, who's your broker? Oh, Merrill Lynch, UBS, why? How much gold do you have? I don't know, 3 4%. How much Bitcoin do you have? Are you kidding me? Zero. It's a Ponzi scheme. Haven't you heard that Peter Schiff guy? How often do you use DeFi? What's that? Ask anyone under 35, who's your broker? What's a broker? You mean, you mean Robinhood? I got a Robinhood account. Okay. How much gold do you have? Oh, zero. Boomer rocks? Are you kidding me? Haven't you heard that Peter Schiff guy? How much Bitcoin do you have? I don't want to talk about it. Why not? Because it's like a really big percentage of my net worth. I'm kind of embarrassed. How often do you use DeFi? Every day. So that digital divide is real. 37 trillion. Okay, y'all, come on. Somebody shudder just a little when I throw out the T word. Y'all know what a trillion is, right? I'm going to lock the doors. I'm going to make you sit here with me for 31,710 years. I promise that would be really unpleasant. And you got to spend a dollar every second. That's one trillion. Thirty-seven trillion dollars is going to go from us, the boomers, to the echo boomers, our kids. And that money is not going to stay in the traditional world. It is going to the digital world. So a plan conceived in moderation must fail when circumstances are set in extremes. It doesn't say might fail. It doesn't say must do a little bit badly. It says must fail. So we all created this, this way of thinking about investing in a time of moderation. We are not in a time of moderation. We are in a time of exponential growth in technology. And it demands, it demands a new plan. We overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. The next decade will show us a 50 times 
increase in uh, technology. So we just can't really comprehend how fast exponential is. So Andy Grove, founder of Intel, a little successful company, you might have heard of him, says there are few things as powerful as understanding when change happens. Change is happening. You can't stop it, right? It's happening. It's like that, you know, in, this, in the uh, night shift movie where, you know, I mean, most people have no idea what I'm talking about. And there's, there's this thing about, you know, uh, the guy saying, the, the idea is they just come at me. I can't stop them. That's the way change happens. The problem is you don't get to wait until you know for sure to act. You have to act with imperfect information. So the way change happens is inflection points. So if it's early, it's labeled a fad. And there have been lots of things that have been labeled fads. By the way, anytime something's labeled a fad or it rots your brain, buy a lot of it, right? Because it will eventually become mainstream. So it reaches this inflection point, and you have a choice. You can either decide to ignore it, ride the wrong horse, or adopt the next big thing. But it's more complicated than that. It's not a single event. It's a series of strategic moments. And Andy said, look, if you're wrong, you die. But companies don't die because they're wrong. They don't actually choose wrong. They just fail to act. Most people in life fail to act, and they miss the opportunities. So the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but embracing the new. When the winds of change blow, some people build walls and others build windmills. Okay, both of those quotes are 2,600 years old. There is nothing new in this world. You don't have to read anything of the new books, all the leadership books. Just read Socrates, Seneca. All of the wisdom was created 2,600 years ago. The reasonable person adapts the world, adapts to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to them. Therefore, all progress... Think about this. All progress comes from unreasonable people. Just ask my wife. She says, I am the most unreasonable person on the planet. Okay? So you need to be unreasonable to have progress. I believe you have to be willing to be misunderstood. Bezos, he knows something about innovation. You might have heard of him. If I asked the public what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. That was not the answer. I love this. The advancement of the arts from year to year taxes our credulity and seems to presage the arrival of a period when human improvement must end. I loved how people talked in the 1840s. Okay? It sound, if I could have a British accent and talk like that, man, I would be so smart. But this guy, the head of the patent office, said in 1843, everything that's been invent that can be invented has already been invented. I'd say there's been a few inventions since 1843. Don't be afraid to take big steps. You can't cross a chasm in two small jumps. Ask Evil Knievel. Most people have no idea. Google it. You'll find out. So this is my pinned tweet on Twitter, at Mark Yusko, if you care. The greatest wealth is created by being an early investor in innovation. Making that investment requires you to believe in something before the majority understand it. Hmm, kind of sounds like church, right? You'll be mocked, ridiculed, and criticized for your non-consensus actions. Lots of examples of that in a book that we all care about, right? It's absolutely worth it. Now, early investors, right? If you invested in the telegraph, which people said, it's impossible. You can't send voice across copper wires. And the people at Western Union said, yes, you can. And if you invested, you made 11,000% returns. That's pretty good. And I love this picture. This is a hundred years before the iPhone predicting the iPhone, right? A hundred years. They were saying that there was going to be a wireless device, and the woman on the left is reading an amorous message, right? She's scrolling Instagram, and the guy on the right, he's kind of pissed off. He's looking at the horse race outcomes. A hundred years before the iPhone. They knew that this was coming. Now, when the telephone arrived, the guy at Western Union said, the telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. Duh. Of course he's going to say that, because it was going to replace the telegraph. And the Americans might have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. Seriously? Come on. So, I love this one. The horse is here to stay. The automobile is a novelty, a fad, said Henry Ford's lawyer. Had Henry listened to him, probably wouldn't have become really, re really wealthy. Now, by the way, Elon Musk did not invent the electric car. The largest car company in the world 
in 1907 was the American Electric Vehicle Corp. There were cars that got 46 miles to a charge. There's one in the basement of the Dartmouth Engineering School. And Henry bought up all the technology, shelved it, so he could sell his Model Ts. That's the way that works. So back in 49, everyone knew computing was over. Where a calculator like ENIAC is equipped with 18,000 batteries, weighs 30 tons, we can envision a day when a computer will only weigh one and a half tons. Anyone have an iPhone? You are really strong, right? One and a half tons, that supercomputer is more powerful than the computer that sent people out into space uh, at NASA. So, and Charles Darwin, we might all admit, pretty smart guy. I can see that one computer per country would be enough to solve all the problems. Or two billion, whichever one, you know, a hundred or two billion. So I've traveled the length and breadth of this country and talked with the best people. I can assure you that data processing is a fad that won't last the year. Like I said, if it's called a fad, buy it. ADP is not even that good a company. And it's done three times as well as the S&P. If you actually bought a good company in computing, you made 100 times. Incumbents always misjudge innovation because they're happy. They like being incumbents. They don't want to be disrupted. While theoretically and technically television may be feasible, commercially, it's impossible. Really. Who said that? The father of radio. Consider the source. So the banks are saying that Bitcoin is a fraud. Duh, because it replaces the banks. We'll get to that later. All right? I love this one. So uh, Digital Equipment Corp invented computing, founded with a little bit of venture capital, a place called outside Boston, $70,000 in 1957. 20 years later, the president, Ken, said, there's no reason for any person to ever have a computer in their house. And then 20 years later, it was bought by a personal computer company. All right, so they misjudged the threat. Innovation happens over long periods of time. So in the 17 and 1800s, it was all about converting mechan or, I mean, uh, human muscle into mechanical power, right? Very highly charged topic, slavery. Slavery went away because of Pennsylvania and the discovery of oil. In one barrel of oil, there are 40 human years of labor in a single barrel. That's why we didn't need as many people to work on projects. So now it's about digital revolution, converting brain power okay, into artificial intelligence. And we've had these epics that happen over time. We had you know, steam and railway, then electricity, then oil, and automobile, then information and technology. The sixth epic is blockchain. This is one of the most important slides of the whole day. So this is my life story. So I grew up, my dad sold IBM mainframe computers. He installed them at hospitals around the country, a lot of Catholic hospitals actually, and uh, where I got my first job. And 1954, DEC invented the mainframe computer. And there were some other companies up there that did really well. And 14 years later, there was an innovation out in Silicon Valley called the microchip, and the center of the universe shifted to Silicon Valley. And then 14 years later, it's always 14 years. Why is it always 14 years? Because young people create everything. A lot of young people in the audience today, young people create everything because they don't know what they don't know. Right? When it was politically correct to still talk about Bill Cosby, I had a record album. It's a little black thing spun around, and you put a needle on it, you listen to it, with Bill Cosby doing comedy. And he talked about this kid who could ride his bicycle anywhere. He'd ride up one side of the swing set, across the top, down the other side. He'd do 360s, six inches off the ground. He never fell. You know when he fell? When someone explained to him about gravity. Young people don't know what they don't know, so they invent stuff. And so they invented this personal computer. Now, I grew up in Seattle, Washington. Many of my friends don't work anymore because they were smart enough to go to work for this little company called Microsoft. I wasn't. Now, I defend myself. Google tonight, original Microsoft 11, and look at these 11 people that founded Microsoft. Now, we all looked bad in the 70s. The clothes were bad, the hair was bad, the beards were bad. Okay, they look really rough. Now, they're multi-billionaires, and I'm not, so I should not make fun of them. But look at the picture. It's a rough crowd. But Steve Ballmer's mom quoted the guy from DEC saying, honey, why would you work for that company? No one would want a computer in the house. He has 18 billion reasons he was right, mom was wrong. 14 years later, I'm at my alma mater at Notre Dame. We invested in this little company called Sequoia. They, had, they weren't famous back then, and they hadn't lost $250 million in FTX. But 
they were a really Im important investment firm that was just being founded by this guy named Don Valentine. We gave them $5 million. They put 10% of this in a company called Google. I remember the board at Notre Dame saying, that's a stupid name. Now it's a verb. By the way, if you want to be successful, become a verb. That's what you want. And we put half a million dollars into Google and Kate took out $200 million. There should be a quad at Notre Dame called the Google Quad. And I had this epiphany. I had this aha moment that investing in the infrastructure of these technological innovation waves was really, really important. I've spent the rest of my career doing that. So in 2010, 14 years later, I remember being at Craig McCaw's house back in Seattle and family office meeting. He was a big investor in, in mobile, te uh, mobile telephony. And I asked this guy, do you think the mobile net will be as big as the internet? He's like, Mark, are you kidding me? Ask people if they want a computer, like whatever. Ask them if they want a phone. They said, I already have two. I got two phones right over there in my bag. I don't need another one. So yeah, the mobile net was bigger than the internet because it became ubiquitous. We always have the internet at our fingertips. Now the blockchain era, which starts in 2024, which we're not even there yet. We haven't even gotten to the good stuff. It's just warming up and it's gonna be bigger than all the rest. Why? Because about connection. In 1954, on the far left, there were no connected devices. Computers didn't talk to each other. Then we had that dial-up modem phase. Remember that eh, 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 kind of AOL thing? And it was horrible. Today, there are 20, I'm sorry, 30 billion. So let that number sink into that. 30 billion connected devices. In 10 years, there'll be 200 billion connected devices. That can't be achieved with mainframes or even client server, or even cloud, it requires blockchain technology. It is absolutely 100% inevitable that blockchain technology will be the operating system of the future of computing. It's not, it's not a question of if, it's just when and how long it takes. Every adoption cycle of every technology in the world follows the same pattern, S-curve. If you haven't read the book, Great Boom Ahead, do it this weekend. All the other books by Harry Dent were not very good, but his first one, The Great Boom Ahead, was really good. And S-curves work in 30-year increments, the first 10 years for 10%, the next 10 years for 80%, and the last 10 years for the, the, the uh, last 10%. And so every technology, right, from the flush toilet, where we're almost at 100, few in North Carolina, we don't have them, but uh, almost at 100%, but everything now is happening faster because technology gets adopted faster. So there's been more technological development in the last 100 years than the previous 700. Why? Exponential growth. The most powerful force in the history of mankind is exponential growth. You have a bunch of pieces of paper on your, on your table. I'd ask you to take a piece of paper and fold it in half again. Try to fold it, I defy anyone in this room, fold that piece of paper eight times. Can't do it. If you could fold it 20 times, it'd be higher than this building. If you could fold it 30 times, it would be the atmosphere. 50 times the sun, 100 times the known universe. If I take 20 linear steps, I'm at that door. If I take 20 exponential steps, I go around the world twice. People are like, that's not true. Do the math. It is the most powerful force in the universe. Now, what happens in inflection points is it doesn't happen once. Company on the left, anyone remember pets.com? The symbol of the failure of the internet. It'll never work. Chewy.com is a $20 billion company. It's the same company. It does exactly the same thing. You order your pet food, it shows up at your door. It's the same company. But we didn't have broadband, right? We didn't have GPS tracking. We didn't have all of the technology to make it work. So this inflection, series of inflection points made it work. Most valuable companies in the world, they're not companies at all. Amazon doesn't make anything. And I guess they're, printing, they're making some knockoff stuff, but they don't make anything. They are a search engine that matches buyers and sellers and takes a cut. A friend of mine bought a little company called Lock Laces. That's the thing you slide down your shoelaces. If you're a marathon runner, I am not a marathoner, so I don't know what that looks like. But he wanted to sell on Amazon. And they said, sure, you can sell on Amazon. We take 45% of your revenues. He's like, 45%? Yeah, yeah, that's how much we charge. And he did it, and his revenues went up 10 times. Good trade. So all these companies are networks. And networks are the most valuable. This is 13% of all, these five companies, 13% of all the market cap in the S&P. 
Why? Networks are different. Networks are different than companies. Networks, originally Sarnoff said, if I am broadcasting to you, all of you that hear me are a node in the network. So it's a linear relationship. The more people I broadcast, the stronger my signal, the more valuable the network. But then, re then Metcalf came along and said, no, 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 no. All of y'all are going to talk to each other, and there's going to be interconnections. So it's actually squared. It's an exponential curve. And then Reed came along and said, well, no, no, no. In this room, right, we have Catholic in common. We're hearing the message. Okay, but we also have some tennis players. We have some people that like to do art. And those sub-networks increase the value of the networks. And I actually came up with something that I'm attributing to this, this friend of mine called the Shadows Law, that as we expand the width of the pipes, we get another order of magnitude. So we're actually talking about 4D chess here. Now, in the old days, if you want to be a big company, property, plant, and equipment, I want a lot of stuff, I have a lot of people. The problem is costs on the right go up linearly. But networks grow exponentially, so your revenues grow exponentially. So that's why your profit is so extraordinary in this world. So, how much will technology advance over the coming 50 years? A quadrillion times. 12 zeros. It's a lot. Hard to comprehend. All right, blockchain. Why is it so important? Anyone ever heard of a ledger? So we've had ledgers for a long time, right? We had clay tablets, then papyrus, then we had this thing called tally sticks. Because the way it worked, in the olden days, let's say I wanted to lend Gerard here some money. So I lent him $100. I wrote down on my papyrus uh, tablet that he owes me $100. He comes back to pay me a year later with $110. I say, oh, no, Jerry, you owe me $220. It's like, no, I only borrowed 100. Nope, says right here. Because I'm an untrustworthy guy. I'm like SBF, right? I changed it to 200. Okay? He had to trust me. So the Medici's came along in 1200 and said, no, 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 that's a bad system. Jerry, you keep a ledger. Mark, you keep a ledger. And we, the benevolent Medici's, for a small fee, of course, will decide that you both wrote down the right number. So we had dual entry accounting, green ledger books. Okay? When I got, this is amazing, when I got to Notre Dame, in 1993, the entire general ledger of the university, think about this, this is not that long ago, this is not like the 1800s, this is 1993, the entire general ledger of the university was kept on a green ledger pad by Brother Otto in pencil. I couldn't make that up. And when I wanted to change my withholding, I went down in the basement and they pulled out a card catalog, took out an index card, erased one and wrote two in pencil. Literally, in 1993. Crazy. So, what's better than a dual entry accounting? Triple entry accounting. A distributed ledger, a computer system that could make sure that we don't need the trusted third party. And this is why the banks hate this. The banks have had a good 800 year run. It's over. They have been the trusted third party to mediate the exchange of value. They aren't, you, they aren't, we have now computer. If you get lost, do you ask for directions? You definitely don't do it where I live in the South, because they say, well, go to where the oak tree was and take a right, then go to where the general store was and take a left. Like, I didn't, I don't know where that is. What do you do? You go to Google Maps or Apple Maps, right? We trust technology, we trust code more than we trust people. It turns out, people do bad stuff. They make mistakes. Code Smart contracts don't. This is a technological innovation that is here to stay. So we are going to replace trust with truth. This is an important concept. If I lent Jerry money, okay, I had to trust that he would pay me back. He had to trust that I recorded it right in the ledger. With blockchain, we have truth. We have an entry on a public database that everyone can see in the world that says Mark has a Bitcoin. He wants to send it to Jerry. And we all approve the transaction. And it's permanent, immutable truth. We've never had a system of truth. Just let that sink in for a second. Truth matters. So we don't have to trust corrupt institutions like FTX. Or JP Morgan. JP Morgan last year was fined $962 million for spoofing the price of gold. 
means they artificially suppress the price of gold to make, to make money. But they said, well, we made 20 bill, so paying one, it's just like a cost of doing business. So we're not going to stop. It's unethical, immoral, I mean, all of it, but they're not going to stop, okay? Because we trust them. They don't have to abide by truth. Now we have a system that makes us all focus on truth. That's why it's inevitable. And it will impact every industry on the planet. Voting. How absolutely ridiculous, given that we have the technology, that everyone could punch a button on their phone and have a cryptographically secure vote, one person, one vote, not like early and often where I used to live in Chicago, not lost ballot boxes in Florida, not, oh, it takes us seven days to count the votes. Are you freaking kidding me? The moment the election's over, we know. In a blockchain world, we know truth. It will change that. Now, the people that run elections don't actually want that to happen, but so it'll take a while. Every industry. How about food? Walmart sells lettuce. Some of the lettuce is tainted. What do they do now? They throw all the lettuce in all the stores away. It's a really bad plan. If we knew the provenance of the lettuce and knew where it was tainted, we could only throw that lettuce away because we have truth. So you can go down every industry for health care. My mom almost died because Epic and whatever the other system is, I forget, aren't compatible. So she had an emergency. She went out of network, right? Went to a hospital, and the doctor couldn't get her record. So he tried to treat her without her record. He's like, you know, if this happens again, we'll have to take your gallbladder out. She's like, I had my gallbladder out two years ago. What are you talking about? And they made a mistake, and she literally almost died because there was no truth. She should own her medical record and be able to hit a button and say, yes, doctor, you can see my medical record. Everything will be on a blockchain. Largest transportation company in the world doesn't own any cars. Largest hospitality company in the world doesn't own any buildings like this. We are in the digital age, and the digital age is big, right? AI, 5G, esports. More, more people will watch esports this year than every other league except the NFL. More people will watch other people play video games than hockey, baseball, tennis. The kid, 14-year-old kid who won the Fortnite World Championship made more than the Wimbledon champ. And I think that's awesome. Because if you've ever tried to play Fortnite, it's really, really hard. I had to pay my son to finish the last level of a video game because I couldn't get my thumbs to move that fast. I happily paid him 20 bucks to get to the final monster. So, and digital assets are right in the middle. I'm going to make a big statement. The blockchain era will usher in a period of unprecedented wealth. More wealth will be created from the blockchain era than any of us will see it's the biggest wealth creation opportunity any of us will see in our lifetime. Full stop. Why? Decentralization of trust, replacing it with truth, and value flowing across the internet. Really big point. So, you heard of the internet, right? Now, this is interesting at a Catholic crypto conference. If you go back a few hundred years, the church, many churches, but the church, had a monopoly on information. Most people couldn't read and write, so what did they do? They went to church, and they were told what to think, what to believe, what the events were, right, from the pulpit. And then the printing press busted that monopoly. And what happened? That monopoly went to media, state-owned and state-sponsored media, then had a monopoly on information. So what did we do? We all sat and listened to Walter Cronkite, and he told us what to think, how to think, what to believe. So then the internet comes along and it busted that monopoly. So now we have information at our fingers. If I want to know what's happened in the Argentinian elections, I don't wait for the New York Times to send a reporter to BA to write a story, go back to the editor, two days later I read about it in the Times. I go on Twitter and watch a periscope of people standing two hours in the rain chanting the candidate's name. I'm like, yep, that person's going to win. That's way better. Blockchain will do the same thing to financial services, which is the biggest industry in the world, right? Media, commerce are big. Amazon, big company, media company, Netflix, big company. Remember the good old days of media? 
I would run home on Tuesday night to make sure I was at my TV tray at 8 o'clock when Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley came on. They owned me. They owned my eyes. They owned my attention. They owned my spending because whatever they advertised to me, I would buy. Okay? They had all the content. They had all of our eyeballs. How did they lose that? Because they wouldn't give up the old to embrace the new. They wouldn't give up the ad-based revenue model to do subscriptions. So now everybody sits at Netflix and we binge watch when we want to watch. We don't have to sit there at 8 o'clock on Tuesday night. So if you think about financial services, it is orders of magnitude bigger than media and commerce. And blockchain disrupts it all. It will become the beating heart of the new financial system. I should probably get the WEF slide out because I hate them. But actually, I'm not allowed to hate, right? I dislike them. I dislike them. Um, do we really need physical banks? Anyone heard of fintech? Like this trend that's been going on for 20 years? The problem with fintech, there's no tech. All we did is take stuff that used to be in banks and put a nice UI UX on it, and that's what we do. So in the old days, you wanted a mortgage, you went to the bank. Now you go to an app. But they used the same technology, 70-year-old technology, Fedwire, ACH, Swift. It's mind-numbing. We've spent billions and billions of dollars building nice apps with no increase in technology. How is it that you can't get your money on a Sunday? How is it that the market is closed more hours than it's open? How is it that if I wanted to send money to my mythical mother-in-law in El Salvador, my mother-in-law is in Tulsa and I'll see her next week, okay, how is it that if I send her a dollar because of the Rothschilds and a bunch of other people, she gets 70 pesos? 30% cost. Because 400 years ago, the Rothschilds signed a contract that said any money that crosses international borders, they get a cut. Two banks that they own get a cut of any money that transfers across international borders. How is that possible? If I sent her a Bitcoin using Strike App, which we're investors in, okay, she gets 100 cents on the dollar. That's better. It's just better. And you probably don't know, 40% of people in this world do not have a bank account. Let's let that number sink in for a second. We're talking 3 billion people. 3 billion people do not have a bank account. Two-thirds of them have mobile phones, though. So we can get them financial services using blockchain technology. So why is it important? Well, one, it's a distributed ledger. It can't be hacked, right? The ledger itself cannot be hacked. Custodians can be hacked and wallets can be hacked. Think about money. How much money has been stolen from the Federal Reserve? Zero dollars. How much money has been stolen from Bank of America's New York office? Zero dollars. How about Bank of America's El Paso branch? More than zero dollars. How about people's wall safe? More than zero dollars. How about your wallet or purse? Lots. The further you are from the source of money, the more at risk it is. So when everybody talks about hacks, they're not talking about the hack of the Bitcoin blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain has been in existence for 14 years. It's been up 99.999% of the time. It's been down for like 22 minutes in 14 years. It has been tried to be hacked every day, thousands of times every day. Not one fraudulent transaction. Has anyone in the room ever had to get a new Visa number because of fraud? Oh, yeah. Okay, why? Because, you know, Visa runs on a mainframe computer. Truth. Runs on a mainframe computer. I asked the guy why. He says, well, a couple reasons. One, it's really expensive to upgrade. And two, it's a moat. No one knows how to hack COBOL. I'm like, that, that's true. He says, the only problem is when it breaks we got to put on a light the Sunnyvale Retirement Home and some 80-year-old comes and fixes it. I'm like, you're not joking because my 84-year-old dad can still code COBOL. No one else can, all right? So distributed ledger is superior because it's more distributed around the world. It's immutable. We can't change it. It's encrypted and programmable, and it's trustless. We don't have to trust the bad people anymore. Now, in the old days, you wanted to exchange goods, okay? You wanted to exchange value. You used to meet under the buttonwood tree in New York. One person had an analog piece of paper, money. The other had an analog piece of paper, stock certificate. And you met. Now the problem was, if you've seen the movie Gangs in New York, it was dangerous to try to get to the buttonwood tree. Those guys with top hats would come and steal your stuff. So they moved it inside and said, well, we'll meet inside so it won't be as dangerous. Well, then they figured, hey, let's do this. Let's turn it into electronic Q-sips. Let's take all the paper 
and put it into a file drawer in Dallas, Texas, where I just was this morning, okay? This is true. There are physical pieces of paper for every stock and bond in the world in Dallas, Texas at DTCC. They process 1.8 quadrillion dollars a year. Crazy, okay? And why do we use a 400-year-old technology? Why do you use paper to trade electronic QCIPs? Let's have digital ownership. Think about the old days, right? When I was in college, I had a Foreigner album, and I loved it. But I lent it to my friend Lucky Rodriguez from San Antonio, and the dude still has it. And I'm really pissed about that. Now, if I had turned it into an electronic form and turned it into an MP3, I could have made a copy and given him the copy. But then the music industry doesn't like that. So remember the company Napster? So Napster took analog record albums, turned them into MP3s, and you could share them. Well, the, the music industry is like, no, Mark, you can't make copies of stuff and give them to Matt. No. So now how do we get our music? Digital. And everybody has to pay. And even better, the artists get what they're due. The people that wrote the songs get a cut, and it's embedded in the contracts. That is superior technology. So digital securities are better because one, we don't have to be physically proximate to each other to exchange. Two, it's immutable and trustless, so we eliminate the seven trillion dollars of friction that occurs every single year in banks, brokerage, insurance companies, all of that. Like today, if you buy a bank loan, it takes 30 days to settle. Are you kidding me? It should settle T instant. Why does it take 30 days? Because there are seven different systems, some written in C++, some written in COBOL, they don't talk to each other. And they employ a lot of people, and it's really good, and, and people make a lot of money being intermediaries. Let's get rid of it all. And then we can unlock that $7 trillion for creative value. $14 trillion trades hands every year, but here's the big thing. $700 trillion. Every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every case of fine wine, every collectible car, every private business, every piece of real estate will eventually be an entry on a ledger. Every piece of property, anything that can be titled, will eventually be a non-fungible token. I like digital property rights. We'll get to that. So Bitcoin, why is Bitcoin important? Anytime a country goes to fiat currency, they collapse. That's just history. You don't have to know about crypto to know that. If you don't believe it or don't get it, I don't have time to explain to you from Satoshi. Uh, Bitcoin is a remarkable cryptographic achievement. The ability to create something which is not duplicable, it's the key, not duplicable in the digital world has lots of value. People will build it. Eric Schmidt, Google guy, he probably knows a little bit about tech. I see Bitcoin as being a reserve currency for banks, playing much the same role as gold did in the early days of banking. Banks could issue digital cash with greater anonymity and lighter weight. More so basically gold, gold's the only money in the history of the world. 5,000 years, gold is money. Money is an asset that exists in the, assets of a acts in the absence of a liability. Everything else is currency. Currency is backed by debt. Gold is backed by faith and credit. Okay, it's real. So it might make sense to get some in case it catches on. If everybody believes it, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So history of money, commodity money, pretty solid, pun intended. Fiat currency, not so much. There have been 775 paper currencies in the history of the world. Three quarters of them, gone. Zero. Went to zero. The rest are on their way to zero. When the pound sterling, the oldest currency in the world, was formed, one pound okay, of sterling silver, one pound note. That's why it's called a pound. Now it takes you 174 pounds of silver to get a pound note. It's a bad trade. So what happens is, you know, the president a couple years ago said, there's nothing behind Bitcoin. Anyone got a $20 bill? What's behind that? If you turn the $20 bill into the government, that green piece of paper, what do they give you? They give you gold? Nope. How about silver? Nope. How about a share of the tax revenues? Nope. How about a piece of a, a, a nuclear warship? Nope. You get nothing. There's nothing behind your money. And by the way, in Israel, they use yellow pieces of paper, okay? And in China, they use red pieces of paper. It's just custom and belief. Things we all know about as good Catholics, right? Custom and belief. That's what makes money, money. You believe that someone will give you a good or service in exchange for that piece of paper. So in, 20, in 1988, The Economist wrote this piece saying there would be a global currency called the Phoenix, and they predicted it would be in 2018. 20 years later, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he, she, they are, came along and said, nope, Bitcoin. I've created a cryptographically secure representation of money. 
And two years ago, Scientific American said it's the future of money. Now, I think it's funny. It's always a gold coin. There's no gold and there's no coins. It's like when they called Madoff a hedge fund scandal. There was no hedge and there was no fund. Right? He hadn't made a trade in 13 years. There was no hedging going on. And there was no fund. He was just transferring money into, his brother-in-law was transferring the money into a personal account. Just like S SBF was doing. Honey. By the way, frauds, always families. So if you're doing diligence on something and it's family members, run away. So Tim May, 1988, which was the, the key for the, the um, uh, Economist article, wrote this thing called the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. It's only a couple pages long. And he predicted everything that would happen in the next 30 years. The problem is he was an anarchist. And he lived up in the mountains by himself. And he had no friends. So it took 20 years for people to actually understand the message, to hear the call. And now we have Bitcoin. Now, the haters are going to hate. Jamie Dimon, J.P. Morgan, it's a fraud. Okay, Warren Buffett, it's rat poison, squared. How do you know what rat poison tastes like unless you're actually a rat? And then his partner, Charlie Munger, one-ups him. He says, it's like trading newly harvested dead baby brains. What the heck, Charlie? Seriously? Now, why would he say that? Because 46% of Berkshire Hathaway is banks. They don't want to be displaced. They are Western Union with the telephone here. They're going away. It's over. Now, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it's over. And they're going to hate. Haters are going to hate. This is the most important slide in the whole deck. So gold, upper right, is money. 5,000 years, one ounce, bought a fine person suit. From a suit of armor to a zoot suit in the 20s to Savile Row today. One ounce, fine person suit. Perfect store of value. In 1973, we went off the gold standard, cut a deal with Saudi Arabia, and said, you protect, we'll protect you at any cost, no matter what you do, as long as you price all oil transactions in dollars. So 8% of global trade is with the United States. 60% of global trade is priced in dollars. So it's worked out pretty well for the dollar. Well, when you go off the gold standard and you can print money out of thin air, the problem is it starts to go down. So if I have a trillion dollars on this side of the room and I magically print a trillion dollars on this side of the room, what happens to the value of that money? It just fell in half. Here's a crazy stat. You won't believe this. From 2020 to 2022, half of all the dollars that have existed in the history of our republic, that's 246 years, were printed. In 18 months, they doubled the money supply after a 246-year period. And people are shocked that prices went up. We don't have any inflation. There's no inflation. Inflation is caused by excess demand and limited supply. I live in Chapel Hill. In theory, Zillow says my house went up 40% in the last 12 months. Did my house grow? Did it get more efficient? No, I actually put money into it to stop it from wearing out. What happened? The money got worse. We devalued the money. That's what's happening. Okay? So crypto replaces that because crypto can't be devalued. One Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. And will always be one Bitcoin. But we don't price Bitcoin in Bitcoin. We price it in dollars or euros or yen or in Argentina or Venezuela or Turkey. There has never been a bear market in Bitcoin. The price has only gone up because their currencies are going to zero, because their dictators are ru ruining their currencies. So we don't think about it the right way. Investing in crypto today is like investing in the internet in 1997. It was the Wild West, it was dangerous, and Paul Krugman said it'll never be more important than a fax machine. Maybe a little more important than a fax machine. So we're exactly on path with the internet. This is a Metcalfe's Law curve, and this was put together in 2014, and it said that Bitcoin would be worth $10,000 in 2017 exactly what it was, and it predicted $100,000 in 2022. Now, my friend Tim Peterson came along and said, well, your, your model's good, but you got your decay factor wrong because there are people that drop out of the network. So he revised it, and we're going to get to $100,000 sometime uh, in 2024 because we're following this S-curve. 10 years for the first 10%, 10 years for the next 80%, 10 years for the, or 10 years for the next. And just think about it. I stole this from actually Kelly's husband because he's amazing, and the uh, thing on the right, this is a trillion dollar asset with a T from zero 14 years ago. Trillion. Okay? Gold, 10 trillion. And Bitcoin is digital gold. Gold is money that exists in the absence of liability. Bitcoin is digital version. It's more portable, it's more divisible. All the gold in the world fits in two rooms about this size. It's really heavy, hard to break in half and send it through your computer. 
Okay? All the Bitcoin fits on my phone. I don't have any on my phone. Don't SIM swap me. Okay? Don't do that. By the way, if you use two-factor authentication and you use a mobile number, change it to an email right now. Do not use your phone number. I'll explain later. So gold is probably only five trillion. Half of it is money. Half of it is jewelry and, and chalices. Uh, money supplies a hundred trillion. Could it get to a hundred trillion? Maybe. If it does, that's a hundred x from here. Over let's say eight to ten years. Wouldn't you make that bet? Wouldn't you have some rather than zero? I would. So this is something called stock to flow. The more scarce an asset is, the more valuable it is. If you can print more money, it becomes less valuable. If I can't print more Bitcoin, I know exactly how many Bitcoin are going to be formed for the next 140 years. Every single day, I know exactly how many are going to be minted. Okay? There's a mining company out there that's helping do that. I know exactly how many. I have to worry about some old, pale, male, stale white guys sitting in a room deciding what interest rate should be. We know the monetary policy of Bitcoin for the next 140 years. Why is that not superior? Well, it is superior in every way. This is all stores of value on log scale, okay? Real estate in red, gold and uh, gold, gold and yellow, uh, diamonds in white, and silver in silver. And Bitcoin has been moving up year by year, TikTok next block, approaching gold, probably reach gold equivalents sometime next year. So I love this, 1971, it's arrived, we have the money printer by 2000. People can't save because their money keeps losing value. Then let them spend it. Okay, 2020, we're in a crisis. Nobody has any savings. Then just print some more and send it to them. Stimmy checks. 2021, inflation's higher. Tell them it's transitory. Just lie. Okay, 2030, room full of money. Where's everybody? Owning Bitcoin. So if you listen to the media, it's a sinking ship. If you actually watch what people are doing, it's the greatest migration of talent in the history of mankind. 30% of MIT grads excluding, you know, the bad ones, Sam and Caroline, but 30% of engineering graduates from MIT this year are going into crypto. The smartest people in the world, those are the smartest people in the world, right? They go anywhere they want. They're going into this space. It's the greatest migration of talent. I gave a talk in 2019, right before COVID lockdown, and this kid comes up to me afterwards. I say kid affectionately. I mean, he's like as old as my son. He says, will you call my mom? You just said it's all good people going. She thinks I'm an idiot. I left this big law firm. So he called his mom and said, no, your son is not an idiot. He's doing really well. Um, so exponential age, 10 trillion. We didn't print 1 trillion. We printed $10 trillion in the last 24 months. $10 trillion. Your stuff's not getting more valuable. The money's getting worse. Okay? And here's the truth. Everyone says, stocks, Mark, you're wrong. Stocks are at all-time highs. Well, they were before this year. No, they're not. They're only at all-time highs because of money illusion. You believe they're at all-time highs because you price them in toilet paper, the American dollar. If you price it in money, gold, they're the same price as 1997. There's been no increase in the value of corporate America since 1997. It's all an illusion. 100% of it is created by debt because it's inflation. They sold you that inflation is good for you. Inflation is theft. Inflation is unethical. On what planet is it good that after 30 years, half of your purchasing power is gone? Why would that be a good thing? From 1776 to 1913, a dollar was worth a dollar. From 1913 to today, as Jay Leno said, I heard they were going to create a dollar coin. They already have. It's called a nickel. Now it's actually worth three cents because the Fed steals your money and gives it to the rich. The average person is more poor now. We have the greatest wealth and income inequality in the history of mankind because the Fed was created in 1913 to steal your money. Inflation is a myth. It is theft. Okay? Okay. So, in 1980, you could fill up a grocery cart for 20 bucks. I went to the store. I don't go to the store very often. My wife said, hey, stop at the store. Get me a jar of tomato sauce. Now, I can't do anything with one thing. you got to walk through a bunch of, I was, oh, I like that, I like that. So I bought a couple plums and, and a couple of nectarines, plopped them down. That will be $17. For like six pieces of fruit, $17? Are you kidding me? I couldn't, I couldn't fill up even a portion of a cart. In 2011, one Bitcoin bought you a whole grocery cart. By 2018, it was a car. By 2030, a house. I love this. The Lambo guy on the left, millionaire, has a Lambo, a mansion, 
2010, Bitcoiners homeless. By 2020, a million doesn't buy you very much in housing. Okay? Bitcoiners got a nice little house. By 2030, millionaires got like Vancouver real estate, million dollars buys you nothing. And the Bitcoiners got the house and the Lambo. By 2040, can you believe he has a whole Bitcoin? Whoa. So zoom out. Mark, Bitcoin's down the last three years. I mean, the last year. Three years, it's up 150%. Everything else is barely up. Five years, 200%. Barely up. Ten years, all those lines are still there. They just merged together and made black. Okay? Up 200,000%. Better. So the world's changing. you got to change with it. Mark Witz was my professor at the University of Chicago, said, won the Nobel Prize, if you take an uncorrelated asset and you add it to a portfolio, risk goes down. So if I take bonds and I add stocks, risk goes down. If I had real estate, risk goes down. If I had hedge funds, risk goes down. If I had Bitcoin, risk goes down. Not up. Risk goes down. Now why? Bitcoin is the most uncorrelated asset in the history of assets. 0.0, .0 correlated to bonds, 0 0.15 correlated to stocks. If you add it to a portfolio, your returns go up and your risk goes down. Not every day, every week, every month, but over long periods of time. And it's because stocks and bonds are correlated because they rely on the same things. Corporate profits, economic growth, and interest rates. Crypto has nothing to do with any of that. It has to do with the fact that millennials are going to own it. It has to do with the technology is coming. It has to do with regulatory development and uh, adoption rates and network growth. So again, slide from off the chain. Here it is. If you did nothing, just did 60, 40, made 11%. Put 2%, not even a lot, 2% over the last five years. You made 13 and a half. Anyone think 13 and a half is superior to 11? I do. And you had no increase in risk. Have you put 10%, not even a crazy amount, you made 24. 24 is way better than 11. Just is. Now here's why we don't. Volatility. We're all afraid of volatility. Purple dot, Amazon. You all know Amazon's been a public company for 26 years. Every single year, including this year, every single year, give me five more minutes. All right. I I'll get done. I see it's a big red zero. I'll get off. Five more minutes. So Amazon's had a double-digit drawdown every single year, including this year. The average is 31%. Think about that. Every year for 26 years, on average, if you held Amazon, you lost a third of your money. This year, it's 49%. When was the right time to sell Amazon? That would be never. How many people bought it 26 years ago and hold it today? There's only five people in the whole world. Jeff, mom, dad, ex-wife, and Bill Miller. That's it. Everybody else couldn't handle the volatility. Bitcoin is the same volatility. For 14 years, it's compounded over 100% with 80 vol, but people can't handle the vol. You don't have to. You can do other things. So, there have been these big parabolic moves. That move on the far left, that little blip, that's a 20-fold increase and an 84% crash. The next one, 20-fold increase, 80% crash. But what happens is we flatten the curve, like real flatten the curve, not the nonsense we heard about COVID. This is real flattening the curve because the increase in the network value is growing exponentially and all the past volatility fades away. So yes, this year, price has gone down. But here's the interesting thing. From three years ago, when we printed 100% of the money supply, the price of money went down by half. The price of Bitcoin should have gone up 100%. Exactly what it did. Funny how that works. It's just math. So crypto winter came. Someone said earlier, I was, wasn't expecting the ice age, which is kind of what we're in because FTX and all that stuff. But I actually think we're in spring. This is just a nor'easter. Hurricane Sam. I live in North Carolina. About once every 10 years, we get a nor'easter in March. It dumps about 10 inches of snow, and we don't know what to do in North Carolina, so we're locked in our house for a few days. That's what happened. We're in a storm. That storm will go away. Spring will come. It will thaw. Summer will be here next year, and we'll be back to positivity. So you can do what the ostrich does. You can ignore it. Ostrich in the, you know, sees the lion come out of the, lays his head on the ground, pretends the lion can't see him. Doesn't bury its head. It's actually a wives' tale. Just lays it on the ground. The lion still eats the ostrich. The ostrich just doesn't see it happen. So you can ignore this and stay on zero, or you can go else. So uh, people don't like volatility, so we created a fund called Crypt that takes the volatility out. So we use cash when things are going down. We use Bitcoin when it's going up. I would do this, but we're out of time. So there's a lot of other stuff I could talk about. You guys have been great. Thank you very much. <laughs>